with the time that I have available, are issues that have been raised by some of you here. What is our relationship to the animal world? Because that raises one of the most important issues about what is the meaning of humanity in the natural world. What is the meaning of humanity in the natural world? Is there any meaning? And I'd like to discuss ways of thinking out problems based on potentiality that will provide a form of rationality unlike the means and rationality we have today. Valuable as that means and rationality is for building bridges and everything like that. And I would suggest that we first take a break and then come back and pick up on the themes that have been raised because they raise the basic themes of whether or not there is a thing called history, whether or not there is a thing called civilization, whether or not there is a thing called progress. How we to guide ourselves and whether or not we are going to develop an ethics that will meaningfully guide us and negotiate us through this utterly relativistic, chaotic, and completely masked world in which we live. A world whose real essence is covered and overlaid by a whole bunch of factors that conceal the essences of the problems we are faced with, the deeper social problems. Is that okay? All right. Take a break if you like. Why can't we... I, for the past hour, incidentally, I've tried to state in a very general sense what social ecology means, what it is trying to do. I'd like to move in closer to some of the problems that are posed in trying to understand our relationship to the natural world and our relationship to each other. These are inseparable problems. If you separate them, then forget it. You go off into a naturism that is more romantic than real, indeed an interpretation of the natural world that can often be very simply misleading and significantly ignore the extent to which we come out of nature and how the forms in which we impact upon the natural world. Nature, as I indicated last week, can be regarded as anything that simply exists. The moon is nature, it's natural. In fact, it's almost pristine, and yet it's a big pile of rock. There's no evidence of any life on the moon and possibly on any of the other, not only satellites, but planets we don't know. This chair is natural in the sense that it is made up of atoms and electrons, protons, neutrons, and so on. I won't go into all the subatomic particles, if you like. It is natural, and in fact, a good deal of it is literally made out of what was formerly organic, a tree, as well as other portions, which incidentally, coming from petroleum, were also made up of something that was once alive. Petroleum comes out of uh, marine life that has been compressed under pressure for millions of years, liquefied, and we call it petroleum. So that when you try to use the word nature, there's a great danger in not understanding that nature is far too ecumenical a term, far too broad a word, to have any meaning unless we differentiate it. We have to start taking the word nature and examining it, taking it apart, deconstruct it, <laughs> if I may use the postmodern lingo of our time, and ask ourselves, what is behind the word nature? Well, surely, all that is, exists is natural, and that would include what is called in ecology abiotic, not living. That would include the magma that rises up through volcanoes with no reason to believe that there's any life form in it. Purely mineral, 
the whole mineral substrate of our planet, of the biotic world. That is natural. What we usually mean when we use the word nature is living nature. Am I right? We're not talking of rocks unless we suddenly develop a great sentiment for the Grand Canyon and start saying, oh, how natural it is. And indeed it is natural, but it is not in all cases biotic. You know what I mean? It's not made up of organic material, although there are places where natural bio, bio, living organisms grow. Cactus, grass, whatever you like, scrub, so on and so forth. And there are microbial life forms which we can't perceive without a microscope and very small insects that we can't perceive without a magnifying glass. So when we start really talking about the natural world, what we usually mean is a certain development that has come out of the inorganic world called organic, don't we? We mean animals, we mean plants. Now these animals and plants there are philosophers, let me put it this way, who will argue that it was inevitable that sooner or later something that metabolized, that could maintain itself in a steady, as it were, conflict with the non-living world, maintain itself through metabolism, building up and breaking down of the materials for protoplasm. That capacity, that active identity. <laughs> no rock struggles to exist, but an amoeba does, doesn't it? It struggles simply by being an amoeba and building up and breaking down anabolically and catabolically or metabolically, retaining itself. It engages in the active force of being itself. Is that not true? A rock star are not busy being rocks. The moon is not busy being the moon. It's there. Where rain falls, you may have water erosion. Where wind occurs, you may have sand erosion. But living things are busy being themselves and maintaining their identity. So that they show a sensibility of self-maintenance, which makes them a unique phenomenon in the non-living or abiotic world, a world that existed, by the way, for billions of years without life so far as we know. And suddenly, four billion years ago, five billion years ago, whatever it may be, forms began to emerge that were busy being themselves, unlike rocks that were simply constituted. They were active. They had an identity. They had a certain self -hood. Now, that is suggestive of the very first elements of rudimentary freedom. Let's say there's an activity going on to be an amoeba. There's an activity going on to be a paramecium. There's an activity going on to be one or another kind of a spirochete or whatever unicellular form you want to talk about. There's an identity. Okay. And that is unique in the natural world until life appears, because no other natural form is busy being itself. It's not engaged in activity. And that is suggestive of the possibility that this activity is in a sense a rudimentary, un almost unrecognizable element of what can be called subjectivity. <laughs> it's a subject. We say it's engaged in being itself. The word self immediately suggests subject. Does it not? Am I going crazy? Can you see that? It's a subject. So an amoeba is a subject. It's not just a rock. It's not just completely passive but it's busy and actively engaged in being an amoeba. And therefore it has a certain self, and as a self it has a certain subjectivity. Does that subjectivity, looking back upon evolution, have any internal logic? I mean, what would follow from that? What would be the implications? 
Well, for one thing, even if you just select Darwin's theory, choose Darwin's theory of natural selection, there's an advantage of being more subjective than not being more subjective, because then you can make choices over the trials and tribulations of the environment that are inflicted upon you on how to best adapt to changes in your environment. In other words, the more sensitive you are to your environment, the more you can do something about the environment to the, within certain very restricted limits. An amoeba cannot live outside of water, so it's limited to water. An amoeba uh, cannot endure certain tremendous temperature variations, hence it must live within certain limits of temperature variations. But when these temperature variations, say, undergo changes, or when the water becomes more and more difficult to inhabit, the amoeba can begin to make selective, engage in an almost subjective form of selection to choose a more comfortable temperature. It can move. <laughs> Some can't. There are life forms that can't move. And they perish. But it can begin to move. I can extend this on and on. As these life forms become more differentiated, as they become colonial, forming colonial life forms, right? Multicellular is the word that we use. They gain the advantage, among many other things, of being able to make very rudimentary subjective choices that are not on the level of consciousness yet. They can't think. There's no evidence that they can think. They react to stimuli. They're tropistic. You know, plants turn toward the sun due to auxins. They open and they flower under propitious conditions. They close under, under, under uh, impropitious conditions. They begin to engage in operations. No rock can do that. And they go through an ever greater, through the course of evolution, through the course of what you would call natural selection, they go through an ever more elaborate differentiation of various tissues, organs, that render them increasingly more subjective. Now, this is very hard to see, quite obviously, when you're dealing with an amoeba. It's hard to see when you're dealing with a sponge. It's hard to see when you're dealing with a hydra. It's hard to see when you're dealing with a whole bunch of invertebrates way down there, as we call it, on the lower evolutionary scale, by which we mean less differentiated, less subjective. But it becomes increasingly evident when we begin to deal with a worm which actively realizes that it's in danger. There's a robin nearby, so to speak. It becomes even more obvious when we start dealing with animals that can move and that can begin to see, and that can enlarge their sensorium, aware of not only variations in heat, but variations in uh, the presence of capacities to sense danger. Also, opportunities to acquire food. And animals begin to function that way. It becomes increasingly evident when we see a white snowshoe rabbit rush for a patch of white snow in a semi-Arctic tundra area to conceal itself, oh, say, from a hawk. That already is an active form of subjectivity in which a choice is being made, in which an opportunity is being exploited, in which the capacity to survive is enhanced by a greater degree of self-awareness. And with that, the anatomical equipment, the brain, to enhance that awareness. So that one can see as one goes on until you start coming to leopards, which crawl. You know, they have to be trained to do some of these things. Most carnivores do not know genetically 